Well, welcome everybody again. Um, we are really happy to have you here. We have two featured Rice alumni panelists with us, which will be a very interesting conversation, I have no doubt. Um, you know, when Paige and myself, I wanted to introduce ourselves first. Um, I, my name is Carrie Pius. I'm the Associate Director of the Alumni Relations team, um, and Paige Bonson is here with us as well, and she's our Assistant Director of the same Alumni Relations team. Um, and so we'll be your, your host moderators here today. And if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to put them in the chat if you'd like, and we will collect those for the end. So just a brief overview, we're gonna have our, each of our panelists introduce themselves and, and share a bit of their own story for a few minutes at the beginning, and then we'll open it up for a question and answer session for the remainder of the time. So you'll have lots of time to ask all of your questions. I wanted to go over a couple of things very quickly before we get started. I'm sure everybody is Zoom pros by this point, but just in case, we ask that everybody keeps themselves on mute uh, just to just remove any background noise unless you are asking a question, of course, and then you're welcome to unmute. Uh, you're also, as I just mentioned, welcome to put questions in the chat. And a couple of, before we deep dive into this conversation, wanted to share a couple of upcoming opportunities as well for Rice Alumni events in the near future. So if anybody is in the holiday spirit in a, next week, we're having a holiday dessert recipe swap, uh, something fun. Um, and then I thought another possible of interest event for this group might be this one that's January 13th, uh, a little bit after the holidays, but Navigating a Modern Career with Mary Humiston. Um, you guys may have heard of her from this sphere for some reason, but founder of Modern Career, and she also has a podcast, um, and she is currently a strategic business advisor to Accenture as well. So she has a great uh, great background and lots of experience to share uh, for folks who are interested in career networking, which might be some of you. Um, and then the next one of this event series, so Spill the Coffee Beans, which are industry-based chats with a variety of different fields and alumni panelists that we invite, um, as you'll see today. Uh, the next one is going to be focused on the travel and hospitality industries. So that one should be timely and should also be a good, interesting talk. So we invite you to always check out what's going on at alumni.rice.edu. Uh, that's a good place for seeing all the upcoming events. So with that, we will move on to today's topic, which features these two lovely alumni panelists that you will see here on your screen. Um, so we have Alex Kierkowski, who is here with us, um, who is the founder of Tilinga, uh, which is a greeting cards company, basically. Um, so I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. And, and then we have Haroldina and Tariana Weiss as well, who is a Houston-based artist. And she will let you into her world of art creation as well. Um, so I don't want to take all your your limelight here. I'm going to turn it over to, to Alex first to share your story with us. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Great intro. Uh, my story um, starts uh, from, I guess, Houston. Uh, born and raised in Houston. Um, went to school, uh, undergrad at Texas Tech University. Uh, graduated from there, then I, I moved into the alcohol space where I used to be a marketer for Jim Beam and Patron. Did that for roughly three years, and then I, I moved into the uh, pharmaceutical space where I've currently had a career for the past nine years or so, and I, I currently still am in the pharmaceutical industry, and I'm doing Tolinga on the side. Um, about three years ago, I decided to go back to school and pursue my uh, MBA, Master's of Business Administration from Rice University. Uh, as most of you guys probably know, it's a two-year-long program. I graduated about a year and a half ago or so, um, and I launched Tolinga essentially a little over two years uh, ago. And um, now that I'm done with grad school, uh, I'm only focusing on, on three things. Uh, my, my girlfriend, uh, uh, my, my full-time job, obviously, and then Tolinga, right? So my, my days are, are extremely long. And so I am the founder and CEO of Talinga. Talinga stands for telling a, as in telling a story. And we create personalized greeting cards that tell people's unique stories. So I'm gonna share my screen and show you exactly how it works so everyone 
knows the idea, the process, and how it all comes together. So what, the, what a customer does is they, they log on to Linga.com, and then from there, they choose a certain story length. So there's four different product lengths that they can choose from. They can choose a one-day story, which is one hand-drawn illustration, a one-week story, which is three hand-drawn illustrations sent out every other day over one week, a two-week story, which is six hand-drawn illustrations sent out every other day of two weeks, and then a one-month story, which is uh, 12 hand-drawn illustrations sent out every other day over one month. So they choose a certain story length. This customer, as an example, actually provided this description. Uh, him and his wife, Sarah, met at a dog park in Nashville, Tennessee. They started dating. They moved to San Francisco for their careers. Austin, Houston, nine years ago, they've had five children, cat and dog. She's a super mom. We live happily ever after, right? And then the customer uploads a photo and then hits submit. And then from there, it gets sent to, off to a team of, of 25 contracted Talinga artists that are located throughout the United States. A lot of them are within Texas because that's obviously where we launched. Um, they then uh, take all those details, the story length, the description, and the photo, and they then begin illustrating out that story on five and a half by eight and a half size uh, pieces of, of cardstock. Essentially, it's like an oversized postcard. There's the backing here on the left and on the right. That's where they do their illustration. And then they begin mailing it out and they send it out every other day for that period of time. And in this example is a two week story. So it's six illustrations sent out every other day over two weeks. And as you can see on the far right, in the top left illustration on the far right, it's them meeting at a dog park in Nashville, Tennessee. Two days later, they received them moving to San Francisco. Uh, middle left, them moving to Austin. Middle right, them falling in love. Them having kids, bottom left, and them living happily ever after, right? In, in the bottom right. So they received a, a physical card in the mail every other day over that period of time. Um, we do uh, apply wax seals, as you can see um, on, on this page, uh, which, which adds a, a nice little uh, element to our carts. Um, you can see some examples in the bottom right of what it, the packaging actually looks like. One thing I'm extremely proud of is we use charity stamps. So for every card shipped, we donate to Alzheimer's, PTSD, and, um, and breast cancer research. So I'm just uh, extremely excited about that opportunity. The whole point of this and what to think about this as is if you were to have a highly personalized storybook and you were to rip out all the pages of that storybook and snail mail them out over a period of time, that's what we're essentially doing. And it's really based off three different pillars. Um, number one is the tap back in the tangible, physical, and old school and kind of nostalgic way of life, getting people to look forward to checking their mailbox again. Everything these days is so electronic and digital and everything is social media and email in that the mailbox is often forgotten. And even whenever it's not forgotten, people go to check it and it's filled with junk mail and bills. So to get people excited about checking it, and I know most people here uh, have a favorite television show. Mine is Game of Thrones. And I look forward to every single Sunday, whenever that next episode came out, it continued that storyline. And that's essentially what we're doing. We're doing that where it's kind of like a um, TV show through your mailbox that you're looking forward to checking the mailbox. What's going to be that next part of the story, right? And you're going to it and you're finding out, oh, you know, we fell in love here. Oh, this is us moving to Austin or us moving to San Francisco, right? And it's kind of that that vibe that you get whenever you're looking forward to uh, checking your TV show. Pillar number two is to innovate and disrupt around the greeting card space as much as possible. To not just create a better greeting card, uh, because for lack of a better word, greeting cards, as we all probably know, suck. Um, I mean, they're very vanilla and, and, and generic, but not just create a better greeting card one for one, but to take the greeting card and turn it into an experience that you receive over time. And then lastly, the, the third pillar is you know, to create an awesome platform for, for young and aspiring artists to, to showcase their work and to get out there in an Airbnb and Uber-like way um, and and uh, have fun doing it too. So uh, that's a little bit about me and a little bit about Talinga. Perfect. Thanks, so Alex. I guess I'm next. You are. Uh, I am Geraldina Interiano Wise, and I, um, my story does not start in Houston, but it sure has 43 years of Houston in it. Uh, I got here as fast as I could. I'm from the volcano in San Salvador, El Salvador, and I came to Rice sight unseen, and it was, um, it was a real adjustment. Uh, Texas was a real adjustment, and, uh, and Rice for sure. I had come from Vassar College, so I'm actually a transfer student, uh, at the, but I had to start from zero uh, because I came in as an 
architecture, art and art history triple major. And so I had to start from zero. Uh, that, that, so that has put me in Houston for a good long time. Um, but what's interesting about the story is it's, I am, um, I'm gonna tell you the story as of right now. I am one of the very lucky people to be a visiting student at Rice because my husband worked there for many years manage the endowment and, um, and as, re as a retiree, he had some benefits. And one day I'm sitting in my studio and thinking, so what are those benefits? Uh, and I called him and he said, well, look them up. I had no idea. So I looked them up and I knew what I had in mind. I had in mind, well, how can I continue growing my art career at Rice? And I found it, I found it in no time flat. And I am terrible at finding things on the computer, but that one I found. And immediately I uh, registered as a visiting student, Karen Broker, if anybody uh, remembers her, she arrived there in 79 when I arrived there. And uh, she's a master printmaker. And I emailed her and I said, can I possibly join your class? And she said, I've been waiting for you all your life, Missy, were her exact words. And, um, and so I got there. I even have one of my classmates here, Isabel, wave Isabel. Uh, Isabel is in my class and we've been in class together for three years. She's a, a Vada major and, and a senior right now. And Isabel and the other kids uh, at Rice have asked me, well, so, so how do you become an artist? And how did you know you wanted to be an artist? And the answer is that the story is, is, is in the making. It's like, it's been making all my life. I started taking um, art lessons in the ravines of the volcano in a very impoverished artist uh, outdoor little house and ravine. And she happened to be the protege of Diego Rivera who had from El Salvador and who had um, gone to Mexico and, and studied under the master and had come back. And my mother heard that and said, well, you're going there every Saturday. So every Saturday from when I was 10, I was at the ravines. And I, so I had a formal education in art, uh, but really wanted to change the world via architecture and giving, um, if you can imagine, an impoverished country in which that, that surrounded me. Uh, it was very touching to me that to know that those children didn't have real homes. And so I thought that's what I'm gonna go do in the world and I'm gonna come back. Well, love got in the way. Uh, I married a Texan and here I am still. Uh, so, but what I'm getting at is that I have studied art all my life. And it was an interesting moment when my last child went off to college and, and, uh, and he said, so now what for you mother? And I stood in that kitchen tile for two hours trying to figure out what is it that I had put somewhere in the confines of my mind away until I had the time and it was art. So I, here I am. Since that moment, I have been doing art full time. Uh, when before we started, I, I, uh, Alex and I were talking, and and he said, "I've never done, I've never worked this hard for so little." I said, "I'm going to use those very words. I have never worked so hard for so little." But in the end, it's not really little. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to share with you my screen and just show you a few visuals so that you have an idea of what is it that I do. Um, I, I am a person who looks for meaning in everything. I think that started with my, uh, with my foray into archeology span with uh, Dr. Walter Woodrig who has passed away um, and uh, who became a lifelong friend because he took me to Italy and I had never lifted a, 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 a hand in my life. And, and I, when I went to him, um, he was the architecture, uh, history of architecture professor and, uh, and one of the toughest professors at Rice. And I went to him and I said, I, I heard that you take kids on an archeological dig. And he said, well, what type of jobs have you done in your life? And I said, I've never lifted a finger. And on that honesty, he took me, he took a chance on me. And I went and I've never worked that hard in my life for so little, meaning a panini of the same eggs every day and a bottle of water. But that changed my trajectory because I understood the connection through space and time of humanity and the idea that things have meaning. 
So I'm showing you um, that one in particular because that's a Harvey painting uh, that I did. I harvested the Harvey rain and that has the, the, the rainwater from Harvey embedded in that, in that painting. So that's the type of thing that I, I'm always looking for things that have meaning. Um, the other thing is that I, I do things that have a meaning of connection and, and, and coexistence with each other and with the planet. I am a huge advocate of the planet. I saw the ravages that happened in my country um, in, in the nature, the most beautiful, uh, pristine country that I, that I lived in and, and what has happened. And in particular, being close to the Pacific Ocean, the oceans have a deep meaning for me. And I am, and so I continue to dig, dig, do research and keep up with what's happening with the planet. And and I think there's a there's a real um, there's a real opportunity for the for art to be the basis of talking about the issues of today, because as as Alex talked about his pillars, my pillars are about how we connect with each other and with the planet, and then how do we provide with art the opportunity of talking about the issues of right now? My second pillar is to be a recorder of time. Well, the time I am recording is the time now, and you will see that when you see the rest of, uh, of my work. These are, um, these are monoprints that I produced uh, at the Print Palace at Rice, large scale uh, on beautiful paper. And, uh, and done with, uh, with, with unbelievable amount of work and, and vision and a lot of luck. And, um, and a lot of the tenets that, that Professor Broker uh, instills on us. Um, so these are the ocean memories, uh, again, about the fact that the oceans have a memory. We come from the ocean because the beginning of man matters to me uh, so that I can understand where I'm headed and where we are headed. Uh, these are another line that are the blue line, third day. I came up with a blue line project uh, during COVID, at the beginning of COVID. I had a version of COVID. It turns out it wasn't COVID. Uh, I came from New York March 9th, and it was the hotbed of, uh, of COVID. And I got extremely ill for two, 12 days and thinking it was COVID, I was in isolation. And I came up with the blue line, the blue line meaning we have to cross over uh, this line to take care of the planet, to take care of ourselves. And that is what this is about. Um, experimental, you can see the colors. Uh, in, in this case, I call it the third day because the blue line for most people that I talk to is still, is still forming. It's, it's, it hasn't formed. People haven't made the commitment to take care of the planet in order to take care of us. The planet has to take care of us but we have to take care of the planet. And so these are blue, almost like links. If you see them, uh, if you saw the other one too, you see that the, the links are forming, but the blue line isn't there yet. The commitment isn't there yet is what I feel. And then uh, this one is called Loteria. It's a, it's a limited edition uh, original prints. And uh, it had to do with, with the fact that we are, uh, you know, we're, we're playing this game of chance of getting this virus and it potentially changing our lives. And, and I needed to, to, uh, to be a recorder of the fact that we're going through the coronavirus time. And, uh, and as you can see in the visuals, I, I chose intense colors because there's intense feelings about all this. And, and there's a lot of turmoil, but I toned it down in the background. This is a multi-plate etching that I'm very proud of, uh, seemingly simple, but it, it, it has a lot of meaning. And, uh, and I have a limited edition of those available. And then with one of those uh, plates, I then did some, some um, collages that are about COVID-19. And in this one, you can see the red on the, on the edge. It's almost like a red tear for those that, that, we, that have left us because of coronavirus. So, and then I took that etching as well and made it into a monoprint, a mono etching. Uh, this one is the year 2020 election day. So it's a red, white, and blue uh, theme, but I needed to record this intense election that we just went through. Uh, and that's what art is about. Um, but I also find meaning in materials. So in this case, uh, this is a sculpture that I did this year during coronavirus. Um, in, in collaboration with uh, John Cryer, uh, who's an architect that is doing 
uh, that is doing the sculpture as well. And in this case, we salvaged the Rothko Chapel baffle decommissioned panels. They are really just basic panels that came out of there for, for, their, um, for their new Rothko Chapel uh, remodel. And, uh, and I said, but those have been bouncing off the Texas light that Christopher Rothko in New York uh, drew in a, in a napkin and sent it to, to Texas to then be reproduced as what we know as the Rothko Chapel. But he had no idea about the intensity of the light of the sunlight in, in Houston. So, so his paintings were, uh, were deteriorating. And so they, they commissioned then the, a baffle in order to, uh, to st stop some of the, that light. Some of the, well, that light. this is what this is. And I'm, I'm really, um, uh, this is another view of it. Uh, and so the idea is, is that, you know, we're doing something, something strong in the sculpture, but that, that is about the bouncing, dancing light that these panels uh, absorbed and reflected. So that, that is what in the meaning is in, in, that, in the panels themselves. And then I just wanted to point out that, uh, that I've been preparing all my life, I think, to go bigger than just the pieces of art that I can make. And in this case, you're seeing the, um, the collaboration, one of the collaborations that I, that I have done uh, with uh, Dr. Brandt out of the Shepherd School at Rice, who's the artistic director of Musica here in Houston. And so I did a live painting performance in the, uh, at the Match Theater last year and to the music of uh, Annie Gosfield, a, a modern classical composer out of New York. And it was um, a really deep experience. And another collaboration that I'm doing uh, that is a longitudinal collaboration is with Dr. Uh, Jose Contreras Vidal at, uh, at University of Houston. He's the head of the Brain Center in engineering over there. And I'm showing you here how I am wearing a brain cap that is a brain computer um, interface that is in real time. Um, I'm wearing a cap there in this, uh, in this visual. Uh, a, a, one of the Nawal um, projects that I do live, wearing the cap, capturing my, my brain waves in real time while I am producing and creating. So the whole idea behind this collaboration is trying to figure out scientifically where are, what is the basis of creativity in the brain? Because we believe that uh, creativity is when the human brain is at its best. And so for medicine, for, uh, for all kinds of rehabilitation of mental health, et cetera, we, we think that there's something there. And so this is, uh, this is one of my, um, my outputs, um, of my, my physical outputs. But then you can see here, when you put the, the brain generated computer output over my, 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 um, physical output and how it changes, uh, during the 15 to 17 minutes of the performance. And then I just want to uh, leave you with my, my last visual, which is one that I'm trying to, um, uh, to expand because I, I do believe that as a recorder of time, the time is now to be able to educate people through art and, uh, and, and, and create empathy. And in this case, it's called One Human Race. And uh, this is about the, the, the genetic, the gene SLC24A5, which gave way to white skin in Northern Europe, probably as much as 7,000 years ago, which is nothing in the space-time continuum. So white skin has only been around for about 7,000 years. And, and I think it's a really important thing to note that, that the genetic makeup of the human race is one, and that, that we really should just stop looking at the differences and look at everything that, uh, that that unites us, which is why I really, that's why I do art. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing all of your stories. And we have a couple of questions already coming in. So we'll, we'll get right to it. Um, I wanted to just comment first. And, you know, when Paige and I were talking about this event, we were trying to find some sort of common thread within the world of the arts, which is such a vast 
category or field just in itself. And so we were talking about how to craft a story through art and how to tell your story. So I, at face value, the two of you are, are so different in your work, but yet you're still finding a way to share those stories of either it's your own or on behalf of other people. And I just think that's really fascinating. So curious to hear more about that. And, and also we've got some good questions coming in. So uh, let's see, uh, Kevin, I know you sent one right to me, but I'm just gonna read it out loud if you don't mind. Um, so Kevin says, we live in a world saturated with visual media. What have you learned that gets folks to engage with your art and understand the value you create? Um, Alex, you wanna start that one off? Yeah, I'm still struggling with that, and, it, and <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's so extremely hard. And I, and I get why uh, that question was asked because I feel like that every artist uh, that bothers every artist, uh, high and low, no matter how successful you are, um, it's it's extremely tough. Uh, how do you get them to value it? For me, the answer to most of all of of those. Question, the questions related to, to what you asked is marketing is, is high level, very targeted, specific marketing. And you put it in front of their face and, and therefore they value it, right? And, and you put it where there's eyeballs. And I feel like the answer to a lot of those questions is, is always going to go back to how many people are, are, are you putting, you, you know, your product in front of your artwork in front of, uh, are you doing it in front of the right people? Um, you know, uh, what is, what is the value? Are, are you able to clearly demonstrate your value proposition to them? Um, and there's so many different questions that, that come from, from a marketing approach, but I, I think, I think it's, it's really tough for me to answer that question. And I, and I think it's almost a cop out for me to say marketing's the answer, but I'm taking that cop out right now because I feel like that's the most truthful and honest, um, answer I can give to that, to that question is, is just high level targeted digital marketing. Um, I, I don't think that Alex is wrong about the marketing um, in particular, because as far as my work is concerned, there's such a conceptual level uh, and, and, and I'm operating in the, in the world of neuroaesthetics and new media uh, with artificial intelligence and this is, um, the story has to be told. And so uh, I was really happy that I get to tell my story here, even though I had to rush through it because we only have one hour together. But, but it's, I think it's when people understand the story and the intent behind art uh, and that coupled with you, uh, your personal aesthetic uh, or your personal uh, aperture to new ideas. Uh, that's when value happens. Um, I actually spoke to um, the, the last Dean of Social Sciences, Antonio Merlo, is, um, is, a, is an economist. I'm, I don't know if anybody knows him, but he's now the Dean of um, Arts and Sciences at NYU. And when he first arrived at Rice, I, I, you know, he's Italian, like I'm half Italian, half Maya. And, uh, and so we connected immediately. And I said to him, look, there is there's got to be a different way in which we uh, we create value for artists because this is a really this is an, an ever um, evergreen kind of problem. And he said there are there are new models that could be introduced in economic models to then put together uh, people with walls and people who produce things for walls. And then let that marketplace, uh, you know, show where the values are. So I think that those things are going to come. Apparently, there is a um, uh, there is an economist at Rice who's working on those type of things. I have to connect back with him. But uh, but I I think you know techno the technology uh, platforms are a game changer. Instagram. If if any of you have Instagram, uh, please follow me at wise under slash arts. Uh, I tell my stories through Instagram and Facebook. You can find me on Facebook as well. And, um, but here's the, the issue. I get an email uh, from somebody uh, with broken English. Um, and remember, I'm a, my English is my second language. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that as a bias, but it starts with broken English. And then it goes to, I wanna surprise my wife with art. 
And I basically uh, just don't answer those emails because that is that is a that is a hoax that's happening on the internet to artists all day long every day. So it so it is very important to almost know the people that are going to be buying your art, and that's that that puts you in, it has to put you in front of a lot of people. Imagine you in COVID nineteen that stopped. Even though I have a studio and it is safe, you know I can bring one person at a time. So, so this is this is an ongoing problem. Thanks. Um, I have another one, Carolina, for you. Um, how do you make the jump from creating art to creating a business to effectively then showcase your art in that process? Um, I I'm going to repeat the words. I've never worked this hard for so little. <laughs> Uh, uh -huh. And the fact the fact is that the I was uh, commenting before that uh, that the art market is bifurcated. Uh, hello, what what else is new, right? We we are bifurcated. Uh, we're polarized. So there's the blue chip artists, and then what I call the light blue chip artists, and then everybody else down from there. This making a business out of it is uh, is a hard proposition, but it is worthwhile because I believe. That uh, that art is is not only important for humans; it is essential for humans. Our better brain is with art. If it is that essential, then surrounding ourselves ourselves by with art is essential as well. So, because my belief is that deep, then I keep fighting towards having a um, a, a, a basically a, a business that is. Uh, that is going to lend itself to to allow me to do more art and and the art that is meaningful to me that's that's the other part that that is really important to understand that that even because I've shown you what is meaningful to me does not mean that I'm going to connect with every one of you but but what you want is that something in there uh, connects with you and then you then go on and, and do some more research you look at artists with that you say well that's an interesting proposition. Who's doing work with artificial intelligence? And then you start going down those rabbit holes. And, and eventually you say, you know, I, I want to have some of that. that. That's the future. And so you see, there's, there's all types of ways to, uh, to try to, to make the sustainability of the art uh, business happen. They're all hard, but they're all worth it. And, and basically, I don't want to leave this answer without saying that uh, that, that my steps nowadays are about trying to get in front of curators who are going to have an opinion about my art and therefore me, you know, take in those opinions, work on that, uh, but also then have some validity and validation uh, towards the, the rest of the art market. Alex, do you want to add anything to that? I feel like you have a maybe slightly different angle to that. Share. Art, art into yeah. I have a more business mindset, right? So uh, I'm not an artist myself. I can draw stick figures extremely well, though. Um, I can tell a decent story, but it, it's more of a, a business mindset, marketing mindset that I definitely have. Uh, so I'm just gonna rattle off a few things. Um, I knew this question would come up, and so I took a few notes uh, that could be helpful for some some people that you know are great illustrators and artists, but then they're stuck. Where do I go next? What do I do? Right, like. How do I monetize my efforts? Uh, once again, doing so much for so little, so much for so little, so much for so little. How, how do I how do I get more than just a little, right? Well, um, the notes that that I have is is really to start off and, and spend. We live in a digital world and just spend a lot of time researching digital marketing. Um, I would highly recommend. I know Rice offers courses uh, on search engine optimization and search engine marketing. Um, but to, to take courses on those and become an expert. And, and if, if you're not willing to pay the money, um, YouTube has been my best friend, uh, whether it's I'm driving and I'm listening to an SEO course that's on YouTube, SEM course on YouTube, and I'm driving and I'm, I'm kind of using YouTube as a, um, like a podcast essentially and just learning as I drive or whether it be I'm working currently and I'm listening to a YouTube video. I've taken some courses on SEO, SEM. I highly recommend at least getting some foundational education done through taking some kind of online or in-person course of SEO, SEM. And like I said, if you can't afford it, go the YouTube route or go the Google route and, and search various folks. Um, uh, Brian Dean with Backlinko and Neil Patel those are the two names I highly recommend learning from, and I definitely uh, learn from them. 
Uh, just recently, Talinga's achieved the, the number one spot for the search term Father's Day gifts, which gets close to 500,000 hits a month. And Talinga just got that number one spot uh, or number two spot uh, just a few days ago. So um, research that. Next thing, uh, consider uh, ads, paid ads, um, uh, whether it be on, on social media or, or, or within Google. That'll, instead of you working really hard on organic search, the organic search that essentially you're doing for free, and you're trying to climb the rankings for free, maybe consider paying for certain spots within Google to show up on, on page one. So can maybe allocate a budget and, and, and run and test, most importantly, keyword test in all caps, uh, certain ad placements, certain keywords, certain times of the day, targeting certain groups, test, test, test. You'll spend a lot of money if you pay for ads. You'll spend a lot of money paying for ads by testing. And then once you test, you're able to, you're starting way out here, then eventually you'll funnel down and you'll, you'll get that targeted approach I referred to earlier. Uh, social media, um, as Haroldina said, I mean, be on every single platform. Most digital marketers will, will say, uh, join one platform and be really good at it and don't, don't get on all of them. Um, I, I recommend a spray approach and finding out where your best friend is and then really focusing on two. Um, Instagram, obviously, Harold Dina pointed that out. I, I hope that we all know that at this point, that is that is king uh, in terms of uh, the visual presence uh, and artwork. Um, Facebook, obviously really good, but to be on all of them, and then once again, funnel, test, 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 and funnel down to see where you're, you're generating the most uh, traffic. Um, to and, and really to, to be extremely aggressive, uh, um, I, I cannot say that enough, like, uh, I feel like there's a there's high level of persistence that um, everyone in the art world must have and to be extremely aggressive uh, with, with that persistence. And you're going to take 10 steps back and then one step forward. And then you're going to take another step forward, but then guess what? You're going to take 20 steps back. And it's just, it's just part of the deal of, of digital marketing because it's so extremely competitive. But it, what, like I said, if you take the courses and you put in the work and you're extremely persistent and aggressive, it usually takes a website to gain significant traction uh, for about, about two years. So Google says, hey, you're legitimate after about two years or so. And then to create a new web page or blog post or uh, create a new uh, art page on your website, it usually takes anywhere between two to six months for that to start ranking. So it does take time. It does take work. It takes persistence. And I highly recommend, you know, building a website as a foundational home. Uh, good uh, platforms, Squarespace, Wix, Shopify. These are all great platforms. But to not just rely on social media for your artwork, but to have a foundational home like headquarter base right that like you could always yeah. point back to and and to work extremely hard on that and then lastly um uh channel partners guys there's there's i looked i looked it up the other day there's 250 plus uh places to sell your artwork online um etsy's amazon artfire amazon or amazon, society six a zazzle i mean there's so many different places to get your artwork out there and once again spray approach getting out on as many as you can, testing, figure out who's your best friend and where you're getting the most return, and then going hard with those respective platforms. So to sum it up, build a foundational website, get on as many channel partner, Zazzles, Amazon, Artfire, Etsy's as you can, and, and, and manage. Uh, take courses on digital marketing, SEO, SEM, understand social media, paid. It's We live in a digital world. And then last but not least, to... to pump steroids into all that via persistence and aggression. Persistence, you can't give up. The people that give up get nowhere. And, and I don't Alex, want to sound- Alex, I want to tell you something. If I do everything you're telling me to do, which I should, I will never produce another piece of art. That in, in the artist world, that takes every bit of your mental headspace and your computer time to produce all of that. And so I, I am listening to you very closely and I will, you have convinced me to call you after this call. Uh, so I, obviously fantastic things you're saying, but in the real world, when you're the artist and, and everything comes down to you making art, that you're, it, this is a 24 seven type of endeavor. I, I work 24 seven. I love doing what I do and I love learning all these 
uh, new technologies. Um, and, and, and I'm taking an, an AI course from Stanford just so that I can understand the AI behind what I'm doing in my collaboration. So I think what, what Alex is pointing out that, that is that uh, like we all know from our time at Rice uh, or any other university you have gone to that even the, in the arts, it's a lifelong learning kind of proposition. Uh, now the, the technology space has, has come and intersected and which I, I think I am absolutely welcoming it but it has added an enormous uh, amount of, um, of work to artists who are trying to uh, get out there and number one, do the work that, that they wanna do, not just be commercial artists, uh, but do the work that is meaningful to them, which I fall into that category. And then, uh, and, and then st still be able to put it out into the world because really it's no good if it's sitting in my studio alone. It, it, you're, you're totally right, it's extremely time consuming. Um, and and, and uh, that's the big challenge with it. And not only extremely time consuming, it's, it's extremely time consuming when you know what you're doing. It, it's even that much more time consuming yeah. whenever you're, you're when learning you it on the fly. <laughs> you're learning it on the fly. Um, I, I, I merely say these things as suggestions. You pick one nugget of the, of the things that I suggested or you, you take all of them. Um, but I'm just kind of throwing a bunch of stuff, marketing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks. And you may find success with, with one measure or the other. I'm just merely kind of laying it, laying out the, the landscape and, and, and answering the question to the best of my ability. So for you guys to play it out any way that you possibly can, given your amount of time, obviously 24 hours in a day, it's, it's extremely challenging to get through all of it. But um, maybe, maybe one or two nuggets you take away from, from some of the things I laid out could be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you to both of you for sharing the practical side and the creative side and how it all fits together or, or maybe not. And it, it is really such a challenge. So this is all really useful uh, tidbit. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, we have some other questions that have been in the chat. Um, so from one from Cristal, uh, if you had to leave on this earth only one piece of your artwork, which would it be and why? Um, so Alex, maybe for you, if you could, I'm going to tweak that a little bit. Um, is there one request for a card series that's been the most memorable for you? I'm going to sure, yeah. Um, to I, I, there's, so, there's so many weird ones. Uh, we tell a bunch of love stories, which is awesome. Um, we, we told a bunch of COVID stories. It's like it's a unique way to people connected during COVID. It's a whole lot of fun. Um, the love stories are really cool, especially like the proposal stories that we tell. Um, the, the coolest story for me is, is like probably the first one, um, the first one that we got outside of my friends and family. It was so hard to start up and I was just trying my absolute best to get it off the ground. And uh, I was getting my friends and family to purchase these just to produce artwork, right? But um, so the first one, I, I actually wrote it down right here. Or let me, you know what? Let me share my screen real fast. I'll just show you it. It's so goofy. Okay, so this right here, this story here. So a nasty storm that develops causing lightning to strike Jack, and, Jack from Jack in the Box. Jack becomes evil and grows to enormous size. It's almost unstoppable. His goal is to take out the rest of the fast food restaurants and he rampaged throughout the city. And then uh, Jody, husband Taylor, have to uh, take them down with su their superhero powers. And they essentially have superhero powers from their favorite video games growing up. So extremely goofy, uh, very fun story. One of the early buys outside of my circle. And so as you can see here, Jack in the Box, he takes over the city. Then they morph into Mario and Princess Peach and then into Zelda and Link and then to Master Chief and then Sonic. And then there's kind of a resolution at the very end. So this has been the kind of the quirkiest one. It's a lot of fun to talk about. Um, and this was my vision early on of, of starting Talinga is, is telling these types of stories, but it's definitely morphed into transition into a more love story based uh, product for sure. Awesome. Harold, what about you? Do you have a, can you for me, identify um, that? <laughs> yeah, I, um, for me, it would have to be this one, the, the one, the story um, I don't know that I can share. 
um, let me go back. Yeah, that one. Um, it, it, would, it would have to be about this series. I, 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 I do things in series because the, the subject matters that, uh, that attract me are enormous. Uh, and so th there's no way to get, um, you know, to, to get everything I need to get into one, one anything, no matter how, how big, I keep going bigger with my uh, art because I have so much to say about these subject matters. And, uh, but in this case, these aren't even that big, but, but I have a series of them. And, um, and actually I'm trying to, to do a installation at Rice um, in the student gallery um, about this because I think this is just one of the most um, transformational of, um, of artworks uh, that every time that I have told someone what this artwork is about, what is SLC 24A5, what does it mean in the history of humanity and what does it mean for the future of humanity? I think that this is the one that I would put in, in that archeological dig for the future and for people to be able to understand that, that, we are, um, that we are the same and we are coming from Africa man, homo sapiens and, uh, and, and there's no two ways about it. it this, this, this is a truth. And um, every time I've been able to say that to somebody and show the art, uh, people, people are, are mesmerized uh, by the fact that they didn't know about that. And educating people on this is, is really sweet to me. And that's, what I, that's why I want it at the Student Gallery at Rice so that, so that it can get closer to the young people who can, uh, who can make a huge difference in society right now. But most importantly, it's that everybody needs to know this that we are the same, we are one human race. That's lovely. Um, Haroldina, this is maybe a, a good follow-up question for, for you. This is from Elias who asked, well, also first wanted to share that your art is beautiful. And uh, so they say, I have always found abstract art so hard to interpret. What recommendation do you have to enhance the experience for the observer? And how can we discern what you have put into it? Um, I, this is a, a really good question and, um, and I'm really glad that you asked it because uh, uh, one of the reasons I do art is because I know that there's an enormous Latino population in the United States that, um, that shares my DNA. And I know that I, I'm, I'm, it's not just because I'm a rice nerd that I connect to science and all these heavy subjects. I brought that with me to rice. That came from my Maya intellectual patrimony. I just had to connect to that. And, and one of the reasons I do art is to try to reach Latino young people and be able to tell them they too have that knowledge inside. So we all have that knowledge inside. So now how do we go about understanding it. And really, to me, it's about um, looking at art and allowing yourself to be in that space with the art. That's why museum going, gallery going is, is a really beautiful way to look at things. I didn't understand uh, uh, the French until I went to Paris and I went and, and stayed with them. And, and then I went playing games with them, like in this unbelievable Monet water lily garden enormous as you know they are, what would have been his last mark? And I went digging into what would have been the possible way in which he laid down the marks. Well, you can do the same with my art. And that will actually tell a story that, that in itself is unbelievably interesting. Once you know, once you are able to decode how a painting is done, how a piece of art is done, I think that, that you're in. And then it's about the feelings. Do you connect or not? By the way, just so you know, anything to do with uh, perception and the human brain, we are two to four seconds behind the brain by the time we realize something. So for example, when you go to a museum, you go to the Louvre, let's go back to Paris. You go to the enormous halls in the Louvre and you walk and walk and walk and after you've seen enormous French paintings for you know, one and a half hours, you kind of just go past them. And then you'll stop on your tracks 
and say, wait a minute, what did I just see? You are four seconds behind. Your brain already figured that there was something in that painting. You weren't even looking, but the brain figured out that it got you. Well, take advantage of that, that feeling. Turn around, go back and look because your brain already digested that something in the ethos of your brain has connected to that. And that's how deep the connection to art can be. D things that you don't even know you're connecting to. You don't even know what they are, especially in abstract art, it's not easy to, to know. And yet uh, a, a student at Rice that saw some of my pieces said to me, an engineering student said to me, I didn't know that I couldn't live without this until, the, until this, this piece, until I saw it. And she had never taken art and she had, didn't own a piece of art. And there she said, I, if I could pay it to you in installments, I will. And that was a really beautiful moment that proved to me that, that even if you don't have the background in art, that it really is about the feeling. Now she had heard my story and she connected with my story and then the colors connected with her. So this is about connection, but very deep connections. That's why abstract art is to me is, is the ultimate uh, Rubik's cube because you, you don't really know what you're doing. You, you, can't, you can't be making one decision at a time. You've gotta be going, 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 going. Well, your brain is doing that with abstract art. It's going, going, going. Be it that you connect or you don't because that is in your brain. And that's why we don't know why those feelings come out, but they're there. Perfect. Well, we are just about at the end of the hour somehow already. Um, we have maybe time for one more quick, quick answer um, that I think I'm just gonna go back to the old faithful question of what advice do you have for a new artist? Similar to what you were just saying, Haraldina, but what, if someone is considering, cause I know I've seen in the chat a, a number of people who are, you know, are doing this on the side and considering selling their work or, or whatever it may be, do you have any advice for someone who is in that mind space of, of trying to decide to take the next step? Is there, you know, we've heard some really great practical tools from Alex as well. And so I'd love to hear, you know, one, one last sentence from each of you to, to share that before we close up today. I think you have to have, you have to have the concept clear as to why do you do art? And once you have that concept clear, you're going to edit, edit, edit. I, you know, anything to do with representational, I do not do. I edit, edit. That was my, my way, my vocabulary is abstract. I stick with the abstract. I go digging deeply into the abstract world and I keep growing. Uh, important to know why you do the art, important to know what your concepts are, important to know what your vocabulary is, important to know well, how do you make that art? That is basically your artist statement. When you can write an artist statement, and mine is in my website if anybody wants to see it, but it, when you can write an, app, an, an artist statement and it is meaningful to you and it says what's inside of you, that's when you, you know you have the basis for being an artist. Needless to say, we continue to grow tools. Uh, um, I, I, take, I have taken classes at Glassell. I take uh, classes at Rice. I, and, and I continue to, uh, to do research and I continue to do collaborations. And so it's a growth. It, 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 you cannot be a stagnant artist. It's never gonna work. You gotta grow. So you need to establish your path of growth and you have to establish your tools that you're gonna, the tools that you're gonna use that, are, that make you that particular artist. Wonderful. Alex, do you have any? Final thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd like to thank everyone, obviously, for their time. It's been a very humbling experience, and I'm so appreciative that Rice thought of Tolinga in a way to be successful enough to, to talk with you guys and just means so much to me. And, and thank everyone for, for being here uh, from the bottom of my heart. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet. I really just think that, and it sounds cliche to say this, but really find out what you love to do, I think. Find out what you love to do and really identify what you want to do and, 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 and let your passion guide you. I know you probably read that in a fortune cookie and it, you're rolling your eyes and that's so cheesy, but my, I sincerely mean that. And if I can make it sound not so cheesy, I, I, I would, I, 
I would, but I feel like that's the best way I can put it. That, and lastly, really just being will be willing to step outside your comfort zone and try something you've never done before. And I think a lot of the art that we create is is, is outside of our comfort zones. Not even on on you know a piece of cardstock or canvas, right? That that art might be uh, a new way to approach your business and, and succeed. Um, and, and that in itself is, is, is art, right? And so be willing to step outside your comfort zone as much as you possibly can. So that's my, my two cents. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in.